So good morning, everyone. I want to talk to you today about presents, not the kind of presents we get for our birthday or Christmas, but the kind of presents we have because we're present when we're completely here in the moment. There's a story some of you have heard before from my book, One Bird, One Stone, about uh, Bernie Glassman, who was the first Western teacher in our lineage, you probably know. Uh, he was giving a talk to a group, and at the end they had Q&A, and somebody stood up and said, how can we live in the now? And Bernie said, "Is anybody? would anybody who's not living in the now please stand up? So we're always living in the now, just like all the creatures that share the planet with us, but we're unique in that we somehow have this peculiar human ability to forget we're in the now, and which has a lot to do with the way we use our minds. So sometimes I, in introducing the role of thought in meditation to my university students, especially, I'll say in Zen, there's three problematic areas of thought, past thought, future thought, and present thought. That about covers it, doesn't it? <laughs> um, of course, we all know that the past is gone. It was real once, but it's not real anymore. The future is yet to come. It may not happen at all. And present thought often has to do with judgment. Uh, I'm sitting better than Chris is. Oh no, Lisa's sitting better than me. She's probably enlightened already. Look at her perfect posture. I'll never be as good a practitioner. So those kind of judgmental thoughts in the present are often the problematic ones that don't have to do with past and future, but get in our way anyway. I ran across this quote by the Dalai Lama. He says, there's only two days of the year where nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and one is called tomorrow. <laughs> so in session, I know a lot of you are quite experienced with session, but it's always good to be reminded. Um, in session, we let go of past and future. Our whole job is simply to be present with our experience. It's not wonderful. Our whole joy is to be present with experience, just with whatever's happening now. Whether we're at home or whether we're in person, the schedule is set up so we don't have to think, right? We just go on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and we know what we're gonna do, and it doesn't, there's not a lot of decision-making. Right? Also, uh, Roshi, on the opening night of session spoke of noble silence. And so it's, we keep noble silence without in our interactions with others, but we also work to keep noble silence with him to, to settle down the mental chatter, which sometimes takes a while, of course. So, a really useful practice I've discovered is to notice if a certain thought stream that's interrupting my practice is about the past. And I can tell myself, meditation's never about the past. Zazen isn't about the past. Zazen's about now. I'm thinking about the past. I can dispense with it. It helps me kind of pry that thought loose and, and just view it as inconsequential. Similarly, future. If, if we notice that a particular thought stream is about the future, perhaps we can notice that, remind ourselves, Zazen is not about the future. Session is not about the future. Future is not real. Practice of Zazen is about reality. So let's return to reality and dispense with thinking about the future. If you really want a radical notion, then notice that those judgmental thoughts in the present are all about, guess what, ourselves and ourselves compared to other people. So if you want a really radical 
spatula to slide under the veggie burger of ego and flip it over. Then uh, how about being willing to let go of any thought of that's about ourselves? Because Zazen is not about ourselves. Isn't that funny? We come to it often because we're unhappy or because we want to clarify the nature of reality for ourselves. And then we find out that the self is useless in sunset. So so we hear about the present moment. And yesterday, Mui was talking about not only is the present moment a present moment, but there's many sub moments according to a certain Buddhist uh, doctrine. In fact, one, one, um, one number you'll find quite often is 84,000, that there's 84,000 of those milliseconds in a second. Now, I don't know how exactly they measured milliseconds or seconds, but in a Theravada practice, the, the first type of Buddhist practice, there are practices where they look so deeply into the moment that they could they could see. I doubt they could see eighty four thousand. Maybe the Buddha could, but uh, they just like that number it pops up a lot in in ancient Buddhism. But um, let's just say that each what we think of as a moment has it's kind of digital. There's all these sub moments, and people claim if they do that style of practice that they can see. A moment and then the moment shifting and then the moment shifting it's kind of granular and each moment is still i don't know if you've ever experienced that where in zazen when it's really working where you just feel like the moment is utterly still there's no passage of time um, it's said that yasutani roshi says this um that he uses the example of one of those old style news signboards, you know, where the, the lights would go off and on and it gives the illusion of the letters flowing. He would say the letters look like they're flowing, but if you look closely, it's just light switching off and on. Or again, it's like the, uh, if you've ever looked at a 35 millimeter film back when we had actual film, you hold that up to the light and there's a frame and another frame and another frame and another frame, and another frame right? They're all discrete, but when you run them through the projector, in this case, the projector of the human mind, it all seems to move. So, um, yeah, Sutani says that that's an illusion. Every moment is actually perfectly still. And when we hear that, that notion that Mui also spoke of yesterday, that we die and are reborn every moment. That's what they're talking about. This moment ends, next moment begins, it's new, we're, we're new in it. But the funny thing is that to find the present moment in our practice, which is our business, we have to let go of any notion of the present moment because what we call the present is actually a concept. It's defined by past and future. Right. So without past and future, what does present mean? Doesn't mean much. The whole the whole house of cards of time just kind of falls apart. And the eternal moment actually, when we touch it, it actually stands outside of time. We can't look for it in terms of time. Each moment is still and eternal. This is something that we can actually experience for ourselves and when we hear about the birthless and deathless for instance that's one way into it when we're out of time there's no birth there's no death and somehow we humans we live in this stream of time but we have the ability also to see this timeless realm and i think all religious traditions have this and we are in a certain state of mind when we perceive that timelessness and when we come back, we want to explain what we've seen in terms of time, right? So we've just seen, wow, I know that I, I know that my true self is eternal. I'm not going anywhere. 
I wasn't born, it's, it's wasn't born, it's not gonna die. And then we come back to our normal everyday lives and we think, but wait a minute, I know I'm gonna die. So it must be, it must be that we're eternal after we die, right? We're trying to, exp we're trying to explain the non-temporal in terms of time. And thus we end up with all these notions of what happens after death. But actually it can be experienced right now, that eternal moment, we don't have to wait for death to try and figure out what happens afterward. It's, uh, it's kind of the wrong, it's the wrong kind of mind applied to the question, right? The eternal is right now. It's a little bit like, it's reminiscent of, if you've ever looked into physics and you know there's the particle versus wave theory of photons or energy packets, if you look at them, as particles, you, if you measure them as particles, they're particles. If you measure them as waves, they're waves. Well, if you look with the eye of Zazen deeply into time, you'll find those individual 84,000 particles, maybe not 84,000, but you'll, you'll find those individual still particles. But our normal way of perceiving it is in a wave, is in a flow, right? So if you look for the present, you'll find that it's conceptual. We have to get behind the conceptual to really experience the real presence of the present moment. It's a paradox, one of those many paradoxes. But fortunately, I looked into the etymology of the word present and presence, and I discovered that we're not the only ones who can't find the presence, that, we, that, that, can't, uh, that can't find the present moment. The, um, you know, it's funny when you dig into the definitions of some of these really basic terms and where they came from, the definitions become circular and so abstract. It's like they don't say anything. And apparently both words come from the same 14th century French, medieval French, um, prayas or something like that is the original. And, um, and the way the original definition for present this comes from the 14th century, just after the time of Dogen, is existing at the time. Existing at the time. What on earth does that mean exactly? What time? <laughs> what, what, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a circular definition, but, but the definition of presence is even more circular because it's the state of being present. So what does that mean exactly? Or it's also defined as the state of being in a certain place and not another. So if I'm in another place, I'm not present. No, I think I'm, if I'm in another place, I'm also still present. So, um, so nobody knows what, what this present moment is, and yet we can, we can have a direct experience of it. Uh, incidentally, I also ran across the 16th century definition of presence of mind. And it, uh, it's defined as a calm, collected state of mind with the faculties ready at command. Isn't that funny? Somebody discovered Zazen back in the 16th century. I don't know where they, I think that definition came from Europe somewhere, a calm, collected state of mind with the faculties ready at command. Wouldn't we like to have that state of mind? Isn't that what we aspire to? I don't know if the faculties of mind are ever perfectly at our command, but we can head in that direction, right? And then we might consider this thing we often hear, which is that person has presence or we experience this person has presence. And we might consider what it means when a person has presence. And I'm not talking about simple charisma. Some people have charisma, but when a person has real presence, it's usually because they're really present, they're really there, right? Which most of us aren't. Most of us are thinking about something else, right? So how do we practice this presence? I want to just touch on some particular points of practice. So a lot of us are probably working on the breath still. And if we're not working on the breath, it's something we go back to when we get lost, right? So one, um, one formulation that I've, that I've heard is, then we begin by counting the breath, then we move to following the breath, then we become the breath. Finally, the third stage is to become the breath. And that is the way the breath feels to me when I'm really in it. It feels like that's what 
I am the breath. And actually the breath is breathing itself. It's our life force that happens all by itself, right? We can interfere with it or we can have a little bit of effect on it, but, but really it's happening all by itself. We're being breathed. And so there's a way in which it is very close to our actual living reality itself. So isn't it something that we ought to be paying close attention to? In fact, I advocate paying such close attention to the breath that we become breath nerds. Yes, nerds of the breath. By which I mean really to get almost obsessed with looking at the details of the breath. So we're sure we're really feeling it. It's surprisingly easy to think we're being with the breath and we're only halfway being with the breath or we're following some idea of the breath. So when Roshi said that session is to unify the mind, and I said yesterday during the stretching period, let's unify it with breath and body. Zazen's an embodied practice. So to really know we're following the breath, we have to feel it in the body, really feel it. So how do we know if we're really feeling it? Well, do we know, for instance, at what point in the breath, the mind tends to get stirred up? There's some place in your breath cycle where your mind tends to fly off. It's more often than other places. If you notice that place, you can watch for it and maybe the mind won't fly off. There's some place in the breath cycle, usually the exhale where the body, mind, and emotions tend to relax. If we notice that, we can settle into that relaxation and carry it through other parts of the breath cycle. What's the most still place in your breath? Very often there's a place where everything just kind of stops. For many people, it's at the very tail end of the exhale. There's actually four different phases of the breath. And we'll be aware of all of them if we're really closely being with the breath. There's the exhale. There's the turning point before the inhale has its own particular feeling. Oftentimes that's the still place where everything stops. If we, if we let our mind settle into that place, sometimes we can carry it all the way through the in-breath, which tends to be an activating breath where our minds start out. And then there's the turning point or a brief pause before the exhale. So there's all four phases of the breath. Can we be sure that we're being continuously aware at roughly the same level of the whole breath cycle? Or are we phasing in and out? If we look closely, and I'm speaking for myself too, there have often been times where I realized I've gone through a period where I thought I was following the breath and I realize I'm actually subtly checking in and out. So we want our attention to be like a steady flame under all of the phases of the breath. Otherwise it's like putting a pot of tea on <clears throat> and cranking up the heat, turning it down, turning it off, turning it back on. It's gonna take a long time to get a cup of tea, right? So the continuity of attention through the whole breath cycle, very precisely, very nerd-like, very nerdily is, um, it's an important key to building our concentration. And with continuity of attention comes depth. I find, especially working with new students, if they can just carry their attention through one breath cycle without at the same, at the same degree of continuity of intensity, more or less, through one breath cycle, they'll start to feel the sense of stillness, a certain sense of stillness. And more and more in my university classes, I point out that sense of stillness because I find if I point it out, people can see what I'm talking about and they start to understand that's where we're headed. Now, Louis talked about goals yesterday and there are goals that are held by the ego. And then there's just, the subtle direction we head in with our practice because we know it's the right direction. And 
it's okay to head in that direction. It's okay to, to head towards the stillness when, when a still moment opens up. It's okay to place our attention there and begin to practice with subtly sustaining that. It's much like keeping a muscle relaxed if you're in front of your computer and your shoulders want to start climbing, right? It's just that subtle, you know, let's just stay chill. Let's not climb shoulders, okay? You can't do it by force, right? So it takes effort, but it's worth it to really notice are we really being continuous around this breath cycle and the next and the next. And at first the mind might be going, oh my God, this is way too detailed. <clears throat> but if you could just do it for a little bit, we start to reap the rewards of that sense of stillness. It's like a Tibetan bowl where you run the striker around the rim a few times without breaking contact and the bowl starts to sing. In the same way, if we keep the contact of our attention continuously with the breath, if that's what we're working on, our practice may begin to sing. Continuity leads to death. Kind of a side point about the breath is we often have the preconception that we have to breathe deeply and that can really bind people up. Usually when we begin <clears throat> a practice session or a session, we begin with opening up the breath, relaxing the belly. Often it's, it's good to learn to breathe diaphragmatically and breathe deeply. But in deep states of samadhi, the breath can sometimes become very, very subtle. We need to allow it to do that because it's as though we get in this state where the breath doesn't want to disturb it and we don't need much oxygen. So when we hear these stories of yogis who don't breathe for 24 hours or something, um, or stop breathing for hours, um, the kind of yoga I do, Ashtanga yoga, uh, Krishna Macharya was the founder of that school. And he was one of these where for a certain period of time, he could, uh, he could stop breathing and stop his heart. And for at least an hour or more, and people were amazed. And then finally he agreed research that, to allow researchers to come and attach electrodes to him to see what was really happening. It turned out, and, and he was into finding this out. He wasn't trying to disguise anything. What he found was that what everyone found was he was actually breathing and his heart was actually beating, but it had fallen to such a subtle level that it could not be perceived from the outside except by these electronic means. So the breath may become very, very subtle and it's okay to allow that. There's another point in working with the breath or any of our practices, but it's especially noticeable with the breath. Neuroscience tells us that there's actually two aspects of the mind that may function at the same time. This is not the same as multitasking. Multitasking is something else. This is that phenomena we know when we're driving somewhere and we're driving a familiar route and we're thinking about the presentation we have to give at work or the, the Dharma talk we have to give or whatever it is. We're thinking, we're thinking quite closely about what we have to do next but if a cat runs into the road, we'll hit the brake, we hope, okay? <laughs> and so there's, there's a close factor of attention and then there's a peripheral broader awareness that, that can be functioning at the same time. And this is, this is known through neuroscience. Our attention can only fasten on one thing at a time, but there's a more diffuse broader awareness. The reason I bring this up is it's possible to be really focused and fastened on the breath. But to be paying a little bit of attention to our peripheral awareness, to notice when that next thought stream starts to arise and wants to grab onto our attention. And if we notice it, so sometimes we can just diffuse it before it takes hold. I bet a lot of us have experienced that. I certainly experienced that in session before I ran across this, uh, before I ran across this research that tells why it works. It's possible. Yes, to be able to spot those thoughts before, almost before they put their head above the ground. It's like sitting in front of a gopher hole and waiting for that gopher to come up, right? It's like, you know, the, the minute its head comes up above the ground, it sees you watching it, it goes down below again, right? Or a prairie dog, we have prairie dogs, right? 
thoughts will be like that. If you catch them just as they arise, a lot of times they'll diffuse or vanish. So we can, we can kind of be watching the horizon of the mind, even as we're very closely watching the breath. So, in the original way that I practiced, I don't think here in this Sangha, but in the original way that I practiced, there was actually almost a bias against the pleasure inherent in practice. And there was, uh, and I know why that's there. It's because there was this fear that we would fasten onto it and get attached to it. I remember, um, this must have been 30 years ago when Shishin Roshi used to come to Boulder to lead sessions and we do them in uh, this house that this couple who were practitioners owned. And uh, one day, somehow I ended up with Shishin Roshi. I was, I was a very young green student, but we, we ended up wandering all over the mountains looking for a possible practice center for him to acquire because he wanted to move there. And I remember we, um, we knocked on the door of this yogic center. I forget what branch of yoga it was. It wasn't like yoga, hatha yoga. It was some sort of meditative yoga center. And this guy answered the door and he just had these stars in his eyes. And he's like, oh, you know, like this. And, and I don't really remember the whole conversation. I think the place was for sale, which is why we knocked on the door. But the guy was so spaced that he couldn't, he couldn't tell us a thing about the price or who to contact or anything. As we walked away, I remember Roshi turning to me and going, list out. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the bias that, um, that sometimes exists in Zen practice. We don't want to get too hooked on the bliss. There are things that are better than bliss, right? But nonetheless, if we can watch for that still place that often comes at a very particular place in the breath, and we can put our attention into the stillness and just gently seek to sustain it. What are the marks of that stillness is it's pleasant. At first it's quietly pleasant, like a warm bath or a nice cup of tea or something. It's not, it's not ecstasy, uh, but it can really deepen to a deep, deep pleasure. And you know what, that's okay. You know, I, I think sometimes we're, sometimes we're so careful about getting attached to the bliss that that people don't even go towards, that stillness is inherently pleasant. So I don't think we have to fear a little bit of pleasure. You know, it'll actually draw us in if we give it half a chance. And then a lot of people never get to the bliss. My, my approach is let them get to the bliss and then we'll deal with it. <laughs> then we'll deal with the attachment issue. You know, a lot of people never go that far. That feeling of stillness, absorption, perhaps focus, pleasant, a pleasant feeling of absorption. That's the gateway to Samadhi. Most of us, I think, have experienced this. Most of us know it. Oftentimes we don't know that we can actually practice it. We can actually notice when it comes up and gently put our attention there. And then our natural pleasure seeking mind will, if we can, reawaken it. We've often forgotten pleasure-seeking mind as adults. We all had it when we were young, but it will actually want to stay there. It will actually draw us in if we give it half a chance. And then the next thought stream comes by, why would we grab onto it? It's just going to ruin it. It's like we're in a warm bath and the telephone rings. Are you going to get out of the bath and answer it when it's only going to be a telemarketer, right? No, let the ringing telephone of the mind ring. We're in the bath. It's nice. So Part of what I'm saying here is a lot of us are experienced practitioners. At a certain point, we can notice what brings us to stillness. We can notice what the entry point to samadhi feels like. We can notice in a creative way what helps us access that. And we can, we can directly practice that. We all know we can't grasp after an experience, right? That doesn't work. But there's an easing in. It's like, oh, here's that still place. I think I'm going to stay here. It's like that. And almost any technique will eventually wear out. You just get tired of it. So when your technique doesn't work, don't get hooked on the technique. 
you know, I sometimes give a talk at another Dharma center or something and I'll, this is one of my shticks. I'll say, make the practice your own. Be creative about your practice. If you've been practicing for a while, you know what's working, you know what's not working. Yes, there's no such thing as a bad meditation. Yes, we don't want to be egoically goal oriented, but really, come on, we know if we've been sitting for a year and it's not working because, you know, let's do something to, to, wake, to wake the practice up again. I've had people come up to me sometimes after I've mentioned that in a talk and say, well, my teacher 20 years ago told me to count the breath and so I, and then he died. And so I've been doing it ever since. I'm like, forget counting the breath, do something else, you know, because it's because the reason they're talking to me is it went dead a long time ago. It, it, nothing is happening. Uh, or they get so fastened on the technique, I'm counting the breath and the whole ineffable perfect oneness of all being opens up over here. And they're like, no, no, I'm counting the breath. No, if the ineffable perfect oneness of being opens up here, we head in that direction, right? <laughs> we, that, this is a process of inquiry and that's something we can forget too. Uh, Mui spoke of Shikantaza yesterday. Shikantaza, although I've done hundreds of koans, I've done, I've, I've done the whole koan system. Nonetheless, Shikantaza has been my primary practice. And yeah, there are times with breakthrough koans where you're very one point that I'm focusing on the koan, but I've come to realize that people practice koans in different ways. My method always was sit down, rehearse the koan in my mind, and then put it on the back burner and just do shikantaza and just wait. And eventually, let's see, can, eventually the pot on the back burner will boil over and I'll have an answer, <laughs> you know, have a response. Or it doesn't, and then you go into doksan and you don't know what to say. And we all know what that's like too, right? <laughs> but, but if you're okay with that, that's okay, right? Great ego practice to not know how to respond. Uh, Koans, the, the responses to koans come from a place deeper than the thinking mind. We know this. So really, I would I park it on the back burner and just do shik and taz and let the subconscious work on it. Um, so, but as uh, I've had the same experience Mui, ex Mui shared yesterday, which is meeting people in pure shik and taz lineages. <clears throat> I've had people, I've had priests tell me, well, yeah, I just sit there and I don't do anything. If I think, I just think. And, and uh, really, I think there's a lot of people trying to do shikantaza who aren't getting anywhere. My particular take, shikantaza has worked really well as a fundamental practice for me. But I think the difference is I don't do it as a perfectly non-doing practice. Uh, it can be done too passively. Let's just say I do shake and taza, but I'm interested in the scenery. It's a, it's a process of inquiry. I'm interested in what presents itself in shake and taza. And if it's interesting, I'll examine it. For instance, you may find yourself in a space of pure awareness. We might ask yourself, well, how far does that go? What is this awareness? Is this my mind? Is there any difference between my mind and this big awareness? What, is this the same thing as what other people call God? It's not necessarily that we're thinking a whole train of thought when we're in it, but we're interested in what we're seeing and what we see has certain ramifications. Um, I ran across a formulation for um, contemplative practice recently. Uh, it was in Tricycle Magazine. I think it was in, I think it was in the spring edition. You might look it up. Uh, there's information coming from other styles of, of contemplative practice to us, like for instance, there's Christian contemplative practices um, that may have pieces that we overlook. For instance, we, we have this preconception that practice doesn't involve thinking. Well, it's true when we're doing zazen, we're not thinking. But then we have a Dharma talk and we hear these principles uh, that, that go with the practice, right? Uh, Oftentimes, that's, that's all we do. We hear the talk, and then we go and we sit in, in stillness. But in between, there's a factor of contemplation. We can actually mull over and turn over what we've heard. And we can use that. I would use that as a point of practice. 
So if somebody tells me in a Dharma talk, my fundamental awareness is unlimited, I'm going to go into, I'm going to chew that over a little bit when I'm not sitting. And then when I go to sit next, I'm going to be saying, hmm, I'm going to check that out and see if it's really true. Um, or you hear about impermanence, factors of mind come and go are impermanent. Is that true? I'm going to check it out next time I sit. Meanwhile, here I am sitting on a bench outside and I notice everything's changing every moment. Or I close my eyes. If you want to hear, if you want to experience impermanence, just go to the sound realm. Sound realm is very impermanent. If you're sitting in a place where there's an air conditioner or a fan, there's a continuous sound, but most sounds aren't like that. Most sounds rise and fall out of silence again and again. They're momentary, they're fairly momentary, they have a duration. And the sound realm's very sparse. And yet it's the same world that we see with our eyes. It's just the way we see things visually is so full and things seem so permanent. My desk, if my desk was there yesterday, it's probably gonna be here today. Not so the sound of that bird or the sound of the car door closing, right? comes and it goes. You want to see impermanence in action, don't see, close your eyes and listen. There's, so there's a, there's a process of investigation and inquiry that sometimes gets forgotten. One of the, one of the things to watch for in Chikantasa is even if it's working for us, oftentimes there's a subtle sense of a standpoint as though we're watching from a certain place in that awareness field. It's really interesting to look for that. It's as though we're standing at the edge of it, seeing the awareness spread out. Um, what happens if we let go of that standpoint, if we let go of that watcher? Oftentimes that's the point that's hooking us, that's sticking us in Chikantasa. We're not letting go of the watcher. So Mui spoke of hara practice, practicing with the hara and yesterday, and he spoke of it as a difficult practice, and it is. Um, I just want to say something about that because I found it very, very useful to practice with the hara. And one can completely put one's attention there, center oneself there, and then do shikantaza. They're not, they're not necessarily separate practices, but we can't put our attention there by effort. That doesn't work very well. We can't oomph, it. We can't oomph ourselves into the hara, right? We can't do it with foot spot. We, um, we have to settle into the hara. And an image I like to use is if you had a swimming pool full of jello and you tossed a flat rock into it, that rock would make its way to the bottom in no particular hurry. And then it would find where it wanted to settle. And if you let your attention settle in that way, certainly out of the head, zazen's an embodied practice into the body and just let it keep settling, you'll find that there's a place where the attention likes to settle. It likes to settle right below the navel in the heart. There's actually a nerve bundle there. It's not even esoteric. There's, uh, there are brain-like clusters of neurons in the heart and in, in the belly. And that's why we sometimes sense something with our heart or we say we have a gut level feeling. That's what we're talking about. That's why we have actual gut level feelings. There's a cluster of neurons there. Uh, I read somewhere that dinosaurs were so big, they needed kind of a second brain to, uh, uh, not quite a brain, but like a secondary cluster of neurons, almost a brain to operate their back halves, which would have been down somewhere around if dinosaurs had a hara. So find your dinosaur hara, find that second brain. The, the mind will want to stop there. It's, it's very peculiar. Um, oftentimes we're trying too hard, right? Watch for the moment where our practice becomes self-maintaining. I bet many of us have experienced this, but sometimes we're so hooked on our practice technique that we don't release the technique at that point where the practice becomes self-maintaining. Uh, just try letting go of the method when you're really in there and really focused. What happens? Will, the, will Zazen just stay? Will that stillness just stay? Will Samadhi just stay and continue to deepen? Oftentimes it will completely effortlessly. It's quite revelatory. 
It really is because in that state of mind, we realize that it actually doesn't take effort to stay aware. Awareness takes no effort whatsoever. If we were to grab onto the next thought, that would take effort. It's as though we reverse. Of course, it takes effort to get to that state of awareness, but there's a certain place. Try it when you feel really settled. If you want to access that relaxation that Mui was talking about, release effort. When you feel your practice is stable, you can always go back to the to the method. You can always go back to the breath. I always go back to the breath. So speaking about that our process of inquiry has ramifications, important ones. When we're sitting without past and without future, and we've even let go of our concept of the present, where is the self? That's really worth, it's really worth looking at closely. What is the self if we don't have the story of the past and the projection into the future? And what if we even let go of that subtle sense of being a watcher here in the present moment? Maybe no self isn't some distant esoteric thing that we'll, that we'll only experience after 40 more years of practice. Maybe it's closer than we think. In fact, I promise you it's closer than we think. And there's different ways and different depths to experience that. But our true nature is not far. We tend to think it's far away. You know, when we access samadhi, our ego sense can't enter samadhi, at least not beyond a certain point. If we really access samadhi, take a look around. You might find that the self isn't there. It's quite a revelation. But well, we have to be willing to inquire. We have to be willing to look, to not be completely passive about our practice. So we get to practice the totality of our lives in session because this is the only place our lives are happening. We're spending our whole lives together right now, as you've heard me say before. This is it, this is the whole thing. So are we gonna be present? It's like the old sweepstakes or raffle motto. You have to be present to win, right? Do we wanna miss it? Or are we gonna be here for it? So seeing no self, seeing into our true nature, No self may find, may seem really empty. Emptiness may sound really empty, but actually we don't know what it is. It's as much a unity or a oneness as it is an emptiness. I don't believe any of us would be here if we didn't have the capacity to realize that for ourselves. We, we know that there's something there to discover and that's why we're here. And I don't think our intuition would bring us here if it was beyond our reach. That's just thought structures tell us that it's beyond our reach. But we'd be off doing something. We, I don't know, we'd be barbecuing in Des Moines or something. I don't know, we'd be doing something more fun. Don't get me wrong, barbecuing in Des Moines sounds great. It sounds more fun than sitting for hour after hour when it's hot. But we're here for a reason. We're here, we've been called here and um, if we answer the call, it's possible the call may answer us. It's closer than we believe. In fact, we find this through the teachings all the time that our true nature is so close that Yasutani Roshi says, it would be easier to miss seeing our true nature than to miss the, stomp, the ground if we stomp our foot against it. And in fact, in the Genjo Koan, commentary, he goes on to say, it is in our foot. It's not even in our foot, it is us. Our true nature is us. Um, it's, it's so obvious that we miss it. It's so obvious that we miss it. In fact, when we see our true nature, that's the way it seems. It seems so natural. It seems like, oh, of course. But, this is the potential of what it is to be a human being. Of course, this is the way it's supposed to be. Why doesn't everybody see it like this? 
maybe someday, I hope someday, <laughs> everyone will see it like this. We wouldn't have war, we wouldn't have starvation, we wouldn't have a climate crisis. Everybody realized this quite obvious unity. I understand it's not always apparently obvious, but there's a way in which it's obvious. I'm just encouraging us to look for that. The only time it's gonna happen is now. Even if it's a later now, even if it's now 10 years from now, it's gonna happen in now. <laughs> so we don't think about later. We don't think about 10 years later, we're going to realize the true nature. Our true nature is only gonna be realized. In this present moment, whatever it is. Mm. So, I encourage us to take the ox by the horns. And as the evening Gatha says, time passes swiftly and opportunity is lost. We live long enough that it can often seem like life has all this time in it and we'll get around to it later. But there's no such, didn't we just prove there's no such thing as later, right? There's only now. So, so we have to motivate, or, motivate ourselves and curiosity, inquiry can motivate us. Suffering can motivate us, even desperation. That was a big motivator for me when I got sick at age 30 with chronic fatigue syndrome and nobody knew what it was or how to address it. I was pretty desperate. That's when I went to practice, really drove me deep. So harness your desperation, your suffering. But beyond that, there's a, um, there's guidance that's often found in some of the Theravadan sutras which is to allow ourselves to grow weary of samsara. Aren't, aren't we ever sick of samsara? Don't we ever just get sick of going around the same issues and the same problems and the same stuff? And we think next week we'll get past it, but then next week it repeats again. The next week it's the same. That's the nature of samsara. We go around and around and around the wheel. The, uh, the ancient Pali sutras even say, allow ourselves to be disgusted with samsara. It's a powerful motivator to just, just look at this endless go round of, of delusion and suffering and just think, I want off of this wheel. If there's a way off of this wheel, I want off. Very, very powerful, very powerful motivation. And when we find our motivation flagging, <coughs> we need to build it up. We need to find a creative way to build it up. So that's about what I got for you today. And I look forward to sitting with you the rest of this week. We'll be coming up in on Wednesday. So those of you who are still there in person will be sitting with you in person. And uh, very glad we'll be able to see all of you, those of you who are there in the flesh. <laughs> and uh, please practice well, and I'll be practicing right along with you.